Welcome back everybody to Public International Law. This lesson is going to talk about the next major source of international law, uh, one of the two major sources of public international law. This second one being the idea of customary international law or international custom. Now I say one of the two major sources because Despite the fact that we are talking about various different sources of international law as enshrined in the statute of the International Court of Justice, it is arguably the case that uh, parts one and two specifically talking about international treaties on the one hand and customary international law on the other hand are the two most important with general principles of law um, being Third, and then the more subsidiary sources, including judicial decisions and the writings of highly valued publicists, being the more subsidiary sources of international law. So it is for this reason that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about international treaties, which we did in the previous uh, lecture. Uh, and then this lesson is going to start to talk about the idea of custom. And we will spend quite a lot of time talking about customary international law in relation to this as well. So, as noted in the previous series of lessons, we explored the nature of international treaties. We noted that international treaties are a primary source of public international law. We noted what treaties were. We noted that they were essentially enshrined by a number of different principles uh, that, are, that are encoded in international treaties. And we also talked about a number of different elements relating to international treaties, including, uh, but not limited to, the idea of treaty reservations, the relationship between an international treaty and a third party, the ways in which international institutions are able to actually get involved in the creation of and the application of treaties. Uh, and this sort of ties into some of the conversations that you may, may be having if you study international law of organizations, international organizational law, uh, essentially the law of the UN, the law of uh, organizations such as the European Union, the World Trade Organization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is not going to be the final few lessons talking about treaties. In fact, we're going to be putting together a series of lessons specifically on the international law of treaties. So whereas we spent a, a good amount of time talking about some of the elements of treaty law in the previous lessons, in, in future lessons time, we're going to do a whole separate series talking about the international law of treaties. As I've mentioned, therefore, the next series of lessons is going to deal with the increasingly important uh, question of customary international law. Now, customary international law is quite interesting, and it is something that is growing in importance, but is also growing in terms of the debates that are had among academics about the nature of customary international law. Despite the fact that international treaty law is still very, very prominent, it could be argued that in a number of different ways, and in a number of ways in and of themselves, the, the, the proposition of and the, 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 the development of international custom is very, very crucial. Custom is something that has the potential to bind even those who are not a party to specific agreements. So where something, where a principle, for example, has gone from being part of an international treaty and entered into the realm of customary international law, it therefore suggests that international uh, states, that states uh, and actors within international law um, do not necessarily have to have been signed up to the treaties that uh, essentially preceded them uh, in order for these various principles of custom to actually apply to them and bind to them. One such really interesting example of this is one of the decisions that was made in the Ethiopia Eritrea Claims Commission. Fundamentally, um, what this claims commission, uh, what this claims commission was set up to do, was to uh, essentially uh, adjudicate over a number of international legal claims that had been made in relation to the parties to the Ethiopia Eritrea conflict. Eritrea became a, an independent state as the result of conflict with Ethiopia, and so as a result of which, and in, as a result of being embroiled into uh, in the conflict with Ethiopia, the the the, the Eritrea train state came into existence and had not ratified and signed on to the 1949 Geneva Conventions. 
So the question that was asked uh, and the question of importance was, to what extent do the Geneva Conventions of 1949 bind the participants in the armed conflict? Uh, given the fact that the state of Eritrea had not been part of the Geneva Conventions. And the Ethiopia Eritrea Claims Commission, I believe it was Claim 4 that came to this conclusion, held that there are significant swathes of, of of the original 1949 Geneva Conventions, essentially all of the original Geneva Conventions from 1949 that have now entered into the realm of being customary in nature. And so they do have a certain amount of binding authority, despite the fact that the state of Eritrea had not been a party to that treaty or those sets of treaties. It's also important since it can allow for the general application of public international law uh, onto states that may or may not be involved in the formal ratification of a particular treaty. And so all of this comes together with uh, uh, illustrating the, the, the importance of international custom as being quite a binding source of international law. On the one hand, uh, one may believe that, given the growing amount of treaties that exist, uh, whether we are talking about multilateral treaties or whether we are talking about bilateral treaties, customary international law is far less significant than it maybe once was. So how can one reconcile the significance of international custom with the factual reality that we have seen quite an, uh, an important increase in the codification of international law through treaty provisions? This is a debate that you can have in the comments down below uh, and is one that is quite interesting when we think about the recent developments in international law. But there are still lots of important parts of international custom that needs to be reconciled with. We'll get into what actually is the process by which for formal custom is created in the next couple of lessons. And we'll talk about the impact of international custom on various different parts of international law.